Thank you much, Brandon, and thank you everybody for joining us. It's uh, great to have participation for this eighth VSP workshop. I'm sorry it can't be in person this time, but we all look forward to next year. For those of you um, <clears throat> who are new to VSP, VSP is not CAD. We're very clear about that, but it is a geometry tool for design, and that that gives makes it worth spending a little time thinking about what that means. And if you remember back to when you took statics in, in engineering school, you'll remember that everything you did started with a drawing. And what you'll find is that shape is really a fundamental starting point for any sort of a physics-based engineering analysis. Whether you're gonna do arrows, structures, mass properties, signatures, manufacturing, whatever it is, shape is the starting point. And no matter what discipline you're doing and no matter what level of fidelity you're doing, shape is that common denominator. Unfortunately, in practice, there's very little commonality when you go out to make these models and do this kind of analysis. In fact, most geometry is misrepresented by the analyses that we do, and that's okay for the most part. CAD models are typically built with a single intent. You might build one CAD model to represent manufacturing, where the target is CAM and the actual real full shape. You might have another CAD model on an aircraft to, to represent the integration and maintenance, packaging, accessibility, those things. Another CAD model, model might represent the structures and yet another CAD model for the aerodynamics to represent the OML, propulsion and control surfaces. <clears throat> That's a tremendous a duplication of effort and tremendously complicated to keep these separate models. There's also a gap. Historically, engineering analysis tools um, used to have their own geometry input. You would specify the wingspan and the airfoils and the twist and the cord in an aerodynamics tool, and it would generate its own geometry representation and do the analysis on that. The more modern approach is a CAD-based approach. This really comes from the finite element analysis world, where you start with a general purpose CAD program, and then you use a gen general purpose grid generation and pre-processing tools that are very generic and don't know anything about the geometry. That only works for certain analyses and for tools that have been developed with that in mind. OpenVSP positions itself in between those. We know about the geometry. We're not a single tool for analysis integrated. You don't have to repeat the geometry description for every tool you use, but OpenVSP can then feed many different tools and it knows that the model is an airplane. Now, there's also typically in practice a lot of analysis fidelity holes, and there's many reasons why this exists in practice and in industry, but for the most part, an organization will invest tremendous effort in getting a single model to analysis workflow working, and there's huge investments in that, and your fidelity is at least limited, if not chosen, by the geometry model you have, and it's hard to change that fidelity later. And so what this means is that a, a design engineer ends up choosing the tool, the analysis tool that they're using, not based on what's the right tool for a given job, but by which tool is fully automated and integrated in our workflow. Which tool do I have the most investment in? And then every time you need to use something, you end up using that same tool. And what you end up with <clears throat> is instead of a densely populated fidelity discipline matrix where you have multiple fidelity choices you can make at every discipline throughout the design process you've just got one here and there and due to those sparse choices you don't get to make the right tool choice independent as you're working now there's many possible representations of a geometry again in cad there's just sort of one representation <clears throat> but there's many ways as engineers we think about the shapes. You might represent a wing as a stack up of a airfoils, or maybe a wireframe, or maybe a smooth surface representation. It might be an unstructured isotropic triangle mesh. It might be a coarse triangle mesh. It might be a thin vortex lattice representation. It could be an FEA model with internal structure, an equivalent plate representation, or an equivalent beam structures representation, and there's many more. Which of these is really the geometry 
And what we want to emphasize with VSP is that the shape is really just an idea. And each of these representations are all representations of the same shape, of the same idea. And in VSP, the true geometry is the parameters, the aspect ratio, the area, the sweep angle, the taper ratio, the thickness to cord. These par parameters are the geometry. <clears throat> and from that, we generate these different shapes. And that's a little bit different than the way CAD would work. Now, representation has a lot to do with the fidelity of analysis you might use. A thin potato chip type analysis representation for a vortex lattice, a surface model for a panel code, uh, an unstructured surface mesh for CFD that then grows to a volume mesh. And this representation very much has to do with the fidelity of the tool, but fidelity is not necessarily correlate directly to the design stage. And this is a, a mistake that a lot of people have, a confusion that a lot of people have, but the fidelity does not increase monotonically as you go through design. Sometimes you need to use a high fidelity tool early in conceptual design, and sometimes it's entirely appropriate to use a low fidelity tool very late in the detailed design process. And although that's may seem counterintuitive and people don't realize it, this is a well-established idea. This chart is from Lee Nikolai's book, and this is from the 2010 edition because it's in color. But if you go back from the 1975 edition, it's the exact same chart, just in black and white. And if you'll notice over in the conceptual design column, he talks about making these changes with parametric parameters like the airflow type, the aspect ratio, the thickness to cord, and the output is a feasible design, but it's about what decisions you're making. In the preliminary design, the parameters get a little bit more detailed. The requirements get more detailed. You're making more subtle choices, camber, twist distribution. You're looking at the, the major loads and stresses. <clears throat> you're zooming in a bit. And then finally over to detail design, where you're going all the way to what it takes to actually produce and make. And you're looking at all of the very detailed stresses and, and the, the, the final stage. And it may be needed, as I said, you might need to use a high fidelity tool in phase one. There may be parts of a design that need CFD in phase one in the conceptual design. At the same time, when you're doing the local strength requirements, it might be appropriate to use handbook methods and just a sharp pencil and paper in order to do stress calculations, a very low fidelity tool in the detailed design phase. And we need to break this idea that fidelity increases monotonically with the phase of design. We need to be able to choose these independently. VSP is a parametric approach. And I'd like you to think about parameters as evolving through the design process. And in, in VSP's case, the shape concept, a component is a wing, combined with, with the settings of the parameters, that is the geometry, that idea and those parameters. And what we have is that in conceptual design, we have these high level parameters with the general concept. In preliminary, we get some more finesse, things get a bit more detailed. And then in detailed design, uh, every aspect is determined. Things really go further. And you'll find that, you know, VSP is totally appropriate, I believe, through the conceptual and into the preliminary design process. And at some point in the preliminary to detail, it's appropriate to switch to CAD and not use VSP as your primary model. You may still use it for some of your analyses, but it's a point in time when you need to switch over. And again, the design phase you're in is about what decisions are being made, not how they're made. VSP has come a long way over the years. Um, I, I hope that introduction uh, gets everybody warmed up and ready for this workshop. This is our eighth workshop. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to them in the past and how many of you made, um, but VSP has been evolving at a rapid pace throughout these workshops and, and the years before. And we're now up to version 3.21.2. At last year's workshop, we were at 3.18. And you can see this history going back. I will say that the, the development pace has been very, very fast. Uh, we've been making some progress here at, at Uber. Justin Gravitt and his team at ES Aero deserve a lot of credit 
for carrying the torch in development over these last couple of years through the SBIR they have with the Air Force. And I'd implore you to look at what version of VSP you're running. And if you're not running version 3.21.2, ask yourself why. Uh, and if there's not a really good reason, go ahead and update. Uh, there's many bugs are fixed in every version. Many features are introduced. Obviously, only the newest version gets any support at all. So please update. There's no reason not to. In fact, since last year's workshop, here's a summary of the features that have been introduced. These are just the biggest, heaviest hitters. We'll be talking about a lot of these throughout the workshop. But um, one of my favorites is the smart input capability where you can do simple math on the fly in VSP text entry boxes. Uh, we have the generic XSEC capability so that you can have in infinite flexibility on cross sections. VSP Arrow has received major updates so that it now does fully general on steady motion, including rotating blades. The GUI support in VSP itself for VSP Arrow has been updated to support rotating blades and unsteady motion. We now have the ability to output trimmed watertight CAD files uh, as a BREP representation to either step or IGES formats, um, including negative components and disk and wake type components, also including the structures. So we can output a trimmed rib and spar type combination to CAD. The API has been extended tremendously, including uh, a full documentation of the API where every function call includes an example. Uh, we now are building a Debian package so that Linux users can more easily install and use OpenBSP. We also now include a 64-bit Windows package ready to go for anyone to use. There's a plot 3D import. The human geom has now mass properties, is tied into the mass properties analysis so that your passengers will contribute to your CG and your inertias. Uh, the mesh geom and human geom are now included in the DGEN geom analysis. Um, there's some prop modifications and then CST support, the class shape transformation cross section type has been extended so that it's not just for wings anymore. It now also works in stacks, bodies of revolution and fuselages. So that's just the, the, the hit list, the high list of features that have been added since a year ago, the last workshop 3.18. And along with that, there's been countless bug fixes, tons and tons and tons of bugs have been fixed. And so with that, there's absolutely no reason not to update. Lots of great stuff to have. And I hope everybody is uh, using the latest, greatest version. I've gone a little bit fast through all of this, but um, that ends our introductory presentation. The way we're gonna work the workshop is all of the presentations, even if they finish, things finish early, We'll start at the scheduled time from the agenda. And so we can jump over to some questions. And if anybody doesn't have any, we will uh, we'll reconvene at uh, in about 10 minutes if there aren't any questions. Thanks a lot, Rob. It seems like uh, we have a few of them. One uh, might be more appropriate for uh, VSPRO talks tomorrow, but uh, someone was asking if we can provide deflections for control surfaces itself inside the wing. My response to that was we can do those things in the solver, but not inside the geometry. Uh, control surface is a subsurface. Do you care to elaborate on that at all? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the the answer right now. So um, right now, the way we uh, deal with, with control surfaces is... Um, for the most part, you model them as a subsurface, which we'll be talking about later today. And also when we do the advanced swing talk, I believe. Um, so you model it with a subsurface and that's just a, a demarcation on the surface. So you're marking an area where the, the control surface goes here. There's no physical deflection. And then that can be carried through to the CAD export, to the CFD mesh, CompGeom, lots of different analysis tools then know about the where that control surface is. And then VSP Arrow um, is one analysis tool that can use that information. VSP Arrow doesn't actually deflect the surface. Instead, it models the deflection of a control surface uh, 
by instead rotating the boundary condition, rotating the normal vector. So with just locally on that control surface. So without actually moving it and having to worry about whether the geometry stays connected and is well behaved through that rotation, it just rotates the, the normal vector in order to model the effect of the control surface. And so as Brandon said, that deflection is right now in the VSP Aero GUI where you group control surfaces um, and you can then blend them and have different gains and that'll model the physics of the deflection. In terms of um, other tools, for example, if you were going to some other CFD tool or some other tool that needed control surface deflections, uh, right now VSP doesn't know about your tool and so it doesn't have a way to communicate that deflection information to your tool. And so there hasn't been a reason to have the deflection angle in the control surface itself. And I also think that it's important that you would probably want to keep it out of that because of the ability to do those gains and that ganging and that mixing. For example, uh, it's very realistic on something like a flying wing where you would want to have multiple trailing edge effectors and you would want to blend them together into something that the pilot sees as an aileron input and as an elevator input. And that ganging and those gains and blending them together is something that's not a purely geometric thing that probably doesn't belong in the component information. In particular, if you're in a vehicle where you're say blending the aileron with the rudder, now those surfaces are even on different geoms. And so it makes sense to group them and keep those gains separately. Um, now, if what you were really asking was for a more detailed control surface itself that actually deflects and that represents that in sort of in a 3D way, um, there's some real challenges to doing that. We've thought about it in the past, and maybe that's something that we could look at again in the future. But right now, the best way to model surfaces, control surfaces in VSP, is using that subsurface approach. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, we've got a few more questions in the social Q&A that we can get to here offline, but for the time being, we've got about five minutes until the next presentation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this in standby, and we will uh, have the next presentation starting promptly at 1130.